the thing about it, me and Adidas, it's like, I could literally say anti-Semitic shit and they can't drop me. I could say anti-Semitic things and Adidas can't drop me. Now what? Shortly after these comments, it was announced that Adidas decided to finally end its partnership with Ye, formerly known as Kanye West. Their relationship was under review for weeks at this point as Adidas wanted to look like they were taking action against his recent anti-Semitic comments without, you know, taking any real action. The fact of the matter is that Ye really did have a tight grip on the company, seeing as he owns the trademark for his sneaker brand Yeezy, which was worth as much as $3 billion. Kanye wasn't entirely speaking out of arrogance when he said that Adidas wouldn't drop him. He knew it would be a big loss for the company. But despite the loyal fans, massive profits and sellout shoes that Yeezy brought to the table, Adidas did walk away. A large business with, you know, past accusations of forced and child labor walked away from $250 million in profit. That's practically unheard of. And it's how you know that Kanye did something irredeemable. According to Forbes, this absolutely obliterated Kanye's worth, making him no longer a billionaire. They officially removed him from the billionaires list on October 25th, 2022. In fact, Kanye's most recent comments have been the final straw for corporate America as a whole. Adidas, The Gap, Instagram, Twitter, Balenciaga, and the creative artist agency have all distanced themselves from Kanye in recent weeks. So what did he do this time? Well, it's a sort of combination of a few different things, but let's focus on the month of October. Early in the month, news circulated that one of Ye's catwalk events at Paris Fashion Week included a White Lives Matter t-shirt. Now, the phrase white lives matter, as I'm sure many of you already know, is a direct racist response against the Black Lives Matter movement. It's a hate slogan. And even if you want to claim that Kanye didn't mean it in that way, which I believe he absolutely did, he could have put plenty of other things on a shirt, but he chose that. Not that this should really be a surprise coming from someone wearing and selling the Confederate flag, but I guess that was all okay with these brands back in 2013 because Kanye claimed he was reappropriating it. Again, I personally find that pretty hard to believe when he's also said that 400 years of slavery was just a choice, but I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Now, choosing to design, create, print, showcase, and then I think sell White Lives Matter t-shirts, now that was a choice and one that plenty of people were disgusted by. Weeks after debuting the line at Paris Fashion Week, Kanye's team donated these shirts to homeless people on Skid Row in Los Angeles, effectively taking advantage of their lack of clothing options and using his so-called generosity as a PR stunt. Maybe he wanted to appear noble, but LA advocates called him nothing more than a faux morality-based grifter. Kanye came to the most economically deprived and abandoned corner of LA to dump his trash and tell a community of unhoused and marginally housed, as well as heavily policed black people that white lives matter, activist Pete White said on LA Can's Instagram. Yet this still wasn't enough. Ye didn't just have to be tone deaf and insulting, he apparently needed to be threatening and dangerous too. The same month, Kanye tweeted that he would go DEFCON 3 on Jewish people, a reference to the US military defense readiness system called DEFCON. Terrifyingly, but not surprisingly enough, there were those that agreed with his message and started spreading it. One hate group held a banner over the 405 that read, Kanye is right about the Jews while lifting their arms in a Nazi salute. Kanye may not have actually stood by them or made that banner, but he might as well have. Even just while working on this script, News broke that the Holocaust Museum of LA was flooded with anti-Semitic messages ever since Kanye told them he didn't want a private tour. The CEO of the museum, Beth Keen, offered said tour in the hopes to educate Kanye and change his perspective a bit. They weren't even condemning him. Yet, according to Ye, Planned Parenthood is his Holocaust Museum. What's so dangerous about this isn't just the misinformation and harmful comments, but the number of people willing to act and spread hate on Kanye's behalf. On Twitter alone, Kanye has over 30 million followers when he made these remarks. 30 million, which as Keen points out, is more than twice the amount of Jewish people on the entirety of this planet. His words absolutely have an impact on people. And even if he's banned from that platform, he continues to spread hate wherever he can. In just a month, Kanye really showed his true colors, but hasn't he done this before? In October, 2022, we got this headline, but we also saw it in March, 2022, after he made a music video depicting himself kidnapping Pete Davidson, then burying him alive. So when exactly did Kanye show his true colors and has he always been this way? I'm really happy for you, I'm gonna let you finish, but Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. 
Hello, and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna be talking about Kanye. Now, this has been requested, though obviously in the past month with just the incredible amount of bullshit that's occurred now, it has obviously increased. And while I know I can't possibly cover everything he's done, I do find it quite interesting just how long Kanye's upsetting behavior has gone under the radar or outright ignored. It's not as if people weren't calling him out before now, but it just feels like Kanye has been given so many undeserved second chances that it's only enabled and emboldened him. Also, please note that like, I wrote this like right after the Adidas announcement, so I'm sure there's more news to come. And as a matter of fact, as a small update, there was also an incident uh, just a couple days ago where he unannounced showed up to like the Skechers headquarters and got escorted out. And then his school Donda Academy also was closed down or something. And then one of the teachers at said Donda Academy broke their NDA or I don't know, is whatever speaking and talking about Kanye's obsession with Hitler and stuff. It's a mess. There is just so much that keeps unfolding, but the point and the pattern is going to be relatively the same throughout most of these controversies we're gonna cover. Now, in 2004, his debut album, The College Dropout, was actually called one of the best 10 debut albums of the decade by Rolling Stone. It was a result of years of hard work, burying himself in songwriting and rhymes since he was a teenager. Though, of course, his relationship with Jay-Z sure didn't hurt either. Even though he was controversial from the very beginning, it seemed like it was for the right reasons. He wasn't afraid to speak his mind, stating that George Bush doesn't care about black people after the president's upsetting response to Hurricane Katrina. A couple years later, he was storming the stage and snatching the microphone from the winners at the 2006 MTC Europe Music Awards, claiming that he should have won because his video cost a million dollars and had Pamela Anderson in it. Three years after that, he basically did the same thing, telling Taylor Swift that while he was really happy for her win, Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time. The whole I'ma let you finish meme went viral in a similar way that Will Smith's get my wife's name out your mouth, that whole thing. Some body. And people seemed willing to laugh it off. Yeah, it was rude. It was crass. It was pushing a boundary, but it just seemed like to be a part of who Kanye was and what his brand was. He later said that he was the one who made Taylor Swift famous and he felt that they still might have sex, which first of all, gross. That is a terrible and just wrong thing to say, especially publicly. But secondly, all of this behavior was just kind of basically forgiven. Ye even threw it in Taylor's face, claiming that Taylor said it was okay if he did these things and hosted a canceled Taylor Swift party with Kim Kardashian. But bit by bit, the comments went from being occasionally rude and outlandish to troubling. In 2011, he compared himself to Hitler stating, and I quote, I walk through the hotel and I walk down the street and people look at me like I'm fucking insane, like I'm Hitler. One day the light will shine through and one day people will understand everything I ever did. Talk about foreshadowing in the worst way possible. I mean, Hitler is hated for, I think, very justified reasons, you know, mainly because he was an evil dictator that ordered the genocide of millions of people. So maybe, and this is just a crazy little quirky thought here, don't compare people's justified loathing for Hitler to their criticism of you. But I guess Kanye felt that this was an accurate comparison after all, considering the anti-Semitic comments he started spewing a couple of years later when he perpetuated the stereotype that Jewish people control the government. Kanye said he felt that this was actually giving a compliment that Jewish people have money and admitted he came off as ignorant. Still, you know you fucked up when even Obama calls you a jackass. Now, here's the thing. Kanye had a damn good publicist at the time who kept him from taking things too far. While some of the things he said crossed a line for many, I still don't think he was really all that hated. His loyal fans were sticking by him. And even if he was problematic, his musical talents were apparently enough to make up for it, at least in the public eye. But in 2018, his image finally took a massive hit when Kanye spoke unbridled in the TMZ newsroom. He started off by saying he loved Donald Trump, that he represented the world and claimed that 400 years of slavery was a choice. Kanye was called out right then and there by TMZ's Van Lathan, who said, quote, "'While you are making music and being an artist and living the life that you've earned by being a genius, the rest of us in society have to deal with these threats to our lives. We have to deal with the marginalization that has come from the 400 years of slavery that you said for our people was a choice.'" And he said it better than I ever could. And frankly, it was probably more polite than I would have been and that I'm going to be today. Though Kanye went up to Van and said that he was sorry he hurt him, he didn't seem to take any responsibility. Sure, he heard Van, but he didn't listen. 
Van later explained that by getting close to Trump and other racist people in power, Kanye was disappointing him and seemingly validating their messages. It's why wearing MAGA hats and saying Trump's my boy as Kanye did was so offensive. But Kanye said that he had to get close to Trump to make a change, to better advocate for the black community. Personally, I fail to see how condoning Trump and calling him my boy would do that, but that's apparently the official story. But this was the last straw for many Kanye fans. Maybe he made comments out of ignorance before, but this one was just a whole new level. The article, What It's Really Like to Be a Kanye Fan Right Now by Adriana Davis detailed how disappointed and numb so many people were to hear these things, especially his fans that, as Van Latham said, really do deal with marginalization. Davis said that ever since she was 16, Ye had been the voice that pushed her to dream bigger, go harder, reach higher, and that he, quote, literally served as the soundtrack to my adult life. The relationship she had with Kanye's music was emotional and almost spiritual in a way. She was ultimately left with a dilemma. Can you separate the art from the artist? Personally, and in certain circumstances, I think you can. If you grew up with Kanye's music, Harry Potter books, The Cosby Show, it doesn't mean that those positive messages and experiences you had as a child or just a younger person are non-existent anymore and that you can't enjoy those memories. But it is important for a fan to make the distinction to support good messages and not the hateful artist, though that's just my opinion anyway. Kanye started to try and make this separation, referring to Ye as the old Kanye and then the new Kanye. But honestly, looking back, it's really all the same person. Even those close to Kanye have said it with rap duo Little Brother stating, he is the same dude, big personality, crazy ideas off the wall. He was that guy back then. He's got a lot more money and a bigger platform, but was the same. Nothing Kanye does surprises me. It's just not old Kanye, new Kanye, nah. If you had them early interactions with him, you saw traces of all of that. Now these traces became more prominent as time went on. And as Kanye and Kim Kardashian divorced, they seemingly grew to be uncontrollable. I go and get the lawyer, change the lawyer so we can finally do the divorce. And then somehow I'm the one that's the stalker. Things between Kim and Ye had been tense with Kanye even admitting that he thought Kim was going to leave him after the TMZ incident. They stuck together, but in 2020, during his short-lived run for president, Kim spoke out about her husband's mental health. It seemed pretty clear that regardless of what you thought of him, he wasn't okay. At rallies, he said he didn't give a fuck if he won. He just wanted to be of service to God. He didn't observe social distancing. He missed deadlines to file fundraising forms with the FEC and platformed on ignorant values. He said that abolitionist Harriet Tubman didn't actually free slaves. She just quote, had them work for other white people. At one point, he even told the crowd about how Kim had contemplated aborting their first child, which is just way too much personal information to divulge without Kim's explicit consent. Despite his harmful and destructive statements, it seemed like Kim was doing all the things she could and being as patient as possible. Granted, we've got no idea what happens behind closed doors, so feel free to take this with the smallest grain of salt. Social media wise, Kim explained how difficult bipolar disorder can be while Kanye apologized and asked for forgiveness. Ultimately, things did not work out. Kim started dating Pete Davidson. Kanye had a brief relationship with Julia Fox and continually begged for Kim to come back. And in terms of like celebrity relationships, if this had been the extent of it, like stopping here, I wouldn't bother writing this into the episode as I don't really and typically believe that celebrity breakup stuff is really my business. However, this goes beyond the typical relationship dramatics as Kanye started a public tirade against Davidson. In his music videos, he had a claymation version of himself kidnap and kill a claymation Davidson. A downright creepy red animated monkey beat up Pete Davidson in an animated version of the same song during the lyrics, God saved me from that crash just so I can beat Pete Davidson's ass. And look, Kanye can say that his art isn't a proxy for ill or harm all he wants, but when you have a fan base as loyal as his, it's pretty disturbing to do something like this. And that's regardless of Davidson sending Kanye a selfie of him in Kim's bed, regardless of the tabloids saying that Kanye was spreading a rumor about Davidson having AIDS, Kanye took things to scary heights that were very unnecessary. He brought personal business into the public eye and even urged his followers to scream at Davidson if they saw him in real life. And Kanye just wasn't going to stop. He claimed Kim put a hit on him, that she was keeping him from seeing their kids, that Kim was failing to protect their daughter North by allowing her on TikTok, and that Davidson was going to get Kim hooked on drugs because he had once been in rehab. The level of harassment was 
just insane. And again, I think this goes past Hollywood drama. Trevor Noah summed it up pretty well on his program when he stated, What we're seeing though is one of the most powerful, one of the richest women in the world, unable to get her ex to stop texting her, to stop chasing after her, to stop harassing her. Just think about that for a moment. Think about how powerful Kim Kardashian is and she can't get that to happen. No matter what you think of Kim, Pete, Kanye, or even Trevor Noah, he made an important point. This story may have seemed fully tabloid and maybe people found it hard to feel bad for Kim considering all the controversial things she's done. I mean, hell, I've criticized her before multiple times, but at the end of the day, she still does not deserve to have her ex-husband harassing her. Plus, these levels of harassment can and do become dangerous. Trevor told his own story of his mother facing the same treatment from her ex-husband, how those around her, whether family or police, questioned what she had done to provoke him. It wasn't harassment, they'd say, she was overreacting. But then Noah got a call from his brother. His mom had been shot. She did survive a shot to the head as it missed her brain, and her ex was convicted of attempted murder. That doesn't mean that this is what will happen between Kanye and Kim, but it's why we need to take these stories seriously. It's why the abuse and the music videos, the vague threats and the constant social media harassment, it's why they're not funny. This isn't a dramatic love story. This feels more like a ticking time bomb. And Kanye seemed to only prove Trevor's concerns right when he lashed out at him using racial slurs and leading to a suspension from Instagram. His rage seemed to spiral and come September, 2022, he called himself along with several other Kardashian fathers, namely Tristan Thompson, Travis Scott, and Scott Disick, quote, cum donors, which what a lead up for that quote. This tirade was sparked by his inability to have a say in where his children go to school. I mean, while I understand that he would want to be involved in his children's lives, maybe don't threaten people with physical violence. If Kanye actually wanted to be a good father and do right by his own kids, then why would he harass the mother of his children at every turn? Why would he lead by example and show his children how he, the father, is treating his ex-wife, their mother? It's gross that articles about this situation end their reports with, oh, hey, I guess it's a good thing that the Kardashians are so rich so they can hire security guards. Like, sure, that is great and all, but the bigger question here is why the fuck should they have to feel so afraid in the first place? Besides, While I can't say I've ever been in Kim's exact situation here, I can't imagine that any amount of security is going to just wipe away those fears. No one should have to be holed up in their house and make their home a prison because their ex-husband is dangerous. Now, when Kim and Pete broke up, Kanye still continued posting disturbing content, like the Photoshopped headline, Skeet Davidson dead at 28, with Skeet being the nickname he used for Pete. He's remained bitter, angry, and hateful. And all of this leads up to today the anti-Semitic comments, Adidas dropping him, and even the most loyal of fans and brands alike being less interested in Kanye than ever. Celebrities have condemned him, social media sites have cut him off, and radio plays have dropped. But he still has the support of notable people, even if it's from the other toxic individuals on social media. Recently, there have been reports that Kanye is planning to buy the alt-right social media platform Parler. The CEO's wife just so happens to be Candace Owens, who also had been seen with Kanye quite a bit recently. Not only was she at his fashion show wearing one of those White Lives Matter shirts, but she defended his tweets saying, no honest person would find his words anti-Semitic. I guess the entirety of the Anti-Defamation League is just dishonest then, right? Like hate groups have said that he was right about Jewish people. Literal pro-Nazi groups have rallied around him. And Owens is going to say that his remarks aren't anti-Semitic. If I try to make any sense of that, I'm going to give myself a headache. Now, truthfully, I don't know if it's possible for Kanye to recover from this. And I don't think he fully deserves to. Maybe that's controversial to say. This is really only an overview of the things he's done. I already have an entire separate episode all about his little freaking weird church situation, but there's one more final thing that I need to say, and I think it really needs addressing, Kanye's mental health. And before we get into that, I'm just gonna take a quick moment to thank today's sponsors. It's the most wonderful time of the year as we are heading into the end of the year. But if you're a small, medium, or even large sized business owner, it's also the most hectic time of the year. Everyone puts off shopping until the last minute. And if you have an online store, you know the feeling of getting hit with a ton of orders at once and just feeling absolutely overwhelmed. And that's what's awesome about using ShipStation. 
ShipStation is a super easy to set up system that essentially allows you to compare and contrast all sorts of different shipping rates, times, availabilities, things you can do with each of your shipments like insurance and all of that and compare all the rates in one place. So it doesn't matter if you're shipping to California, Colorado, New York, Florida, Canada. I mean, I don't know, let's let's go to Germany. Let's go wherever you wanna go, wherever you need to ship something. ShipStation has you covered. That's one of the reasons why I really like them. They make it very easy to take a look and let me know, hey, I need to get this package by this date, or hey, I'm looking for the lowest rate. ShipStation can get that figured out in just a couple seconds. It is super easy, fast, and it saved me a lot of time on shipping. And ShipStation works with all your favorite places to sell online, including Amazon, Etsy, eBay, Shopify, and more. And everything, like I said, is managed from one simple, easy to read and understand dashboard. And many other amazing companies also already use ShipStation, including The Sock Club, Conscious Box, Daily Look, Latched Mama, and Passion Planner. So this holiday season, give yourself the gift of stress-free holiday shopping. Use promo code CASKET today at ShipStation.com to sign up for your free 60-day trial. Again, that's ShipStation.com, promo code CASKET. Self-care is new, but now becoming top of mind for me. But in between meditation sessions and maybe trips to a yoga studio or a nail salon, how often are you actually taking care of all of your needs? Transport your mind to a world where you can relax and treat yourself to your deepest desires with Dipsy. Self-care has never sounded better. And that's because Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women. They bring scenarios to life with immersive soundscapes and realistic characters. Racially inclusive, Dipsy has stories for straight and queer listeners, and 56% of stories are voice acted by people of color. They also have some, may I be honest here, amazing sleep stories that absolutely just knock me right on out, wellness sessions, and a whole host of other things, and sexy stories you can even read. You don't just have to listen to it. If you're into reading it, they've got you covered too. So for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com casket. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com slash casket. Dipsy stories.com slash casket. Bi- it's not an opposite. It's not, I hate being bipolar. It's awesome. It's actually, it drives more of how you really feel. It doesn't do an opposite thing. So I think it's important for us to have conversations about, you know, open conversations about mental health, One thing that I've consistently heard brought up as a reason for Kanye's behavior is his bipolar disorder. It's not I hate being bipolar, it's awesome. It's actually, it drives more of how you really feel. It doesn't do an opposite. Now, this could be a contributing factor, but would it really cause a person to be anti-Semitic? I looked into what psychiatrists say on the topic to try and get a better feel for why so many have used bipolar as a viable reason. As an aside, before I continue, I want to make the point that bipolar disorder can manifest differently from person to person, and there are multiple different types of bipolar that a person can be diagnosed with. We're specifically talking about Kanye and his actions or reactions only. So moving on. MedPage Today published an article detailing Kanye's paranoia over the past couple of years. While his fear of vaccines and views around plant parenthood are frustratingly common in some circles, his visions for a White House organizational model based on Black Panther's Wakanda aren't common or reasonable at all. As for why Kanye doesn't take medication, he has openly discussed that on David Letterman, stating that meds ramp him up. He said, quote, when you ramp up, it expresses your personality more and you have a heightened connection with the universe as well as more energy and productivity. When you're in this state, you're hyper paranoid about everything. Everything's a conspiracy. You feel the government is putting chips in your head. You feel you're being recorded. You feel all these things. Ye also said that he was under the care of a doctor and using alternative care, but medication just didn't work for him. He explained his disorder as having a sprained brain and he didn't wanna push it. Now I have no idea how many different kinds of medication Kanye has tried and I don't know if there's something out there that could work but everyone has to do what's right for them. And I do appreciate that he's trying to advocate for himself. The Washington Post also spoke to experts in the field and those diagnosed with bipolar disorder to get a better understanding of what a manic episode is like. Cameron Caskey told them that with his disorder, he can go from feeling like he's in the darkest depths to the coolest kid in the world. In a manic state, he might spend more money and be more impulsive. For other people with bipolar, this may mean speaking extremely quickly, gambling, sleeping with multiple partners, and other rash decisions. Again, I'm not a psychiatrist, but it makes sense that for Kanye, this would look more extreme. 
Spending a few thousand dollars gambling probably wouldn't matter to him, but running for president? Now that's an impulsive decision. Kanye telling people he's God or a close high to God, that could also be a symptom of delusions, of that coolest kid in the world feeling that Caskey described. Actually distinguishing between a person actively making these decisions and a person feeling influenced by their disorder to make these decisions is no easy task. Steve Hyman, the director of the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research says it is, is it me or my illness question is an entangled and difficult one to answer. Quote, often it is impossible to find a neat separation between a person as they would had been, if not ill, and the influence of a mental illness. But what about taking things to the extreme and spewing hateful anti-Semitic comments? Metzger, who runs a lab dedicated to mental health research and education, has stated that racism itself is not a mental health disorder. And even though bipolar disorder may cause a lack of a filter, it does not create racist values in the first place. Maybe Kanye never would have said he wants to kill Jewish people if it wasn't for his disorder. That's a distinct possibility but it seems pretty clear that he would have had to have these beliefs in the first place in order to spew them. Metzger isn't the only medical expert saying this either. Psychologist Bedford Palmer flat out told Gizmodo that bipolar disorder does not make you racist or anti-Semitic. Clinical psychologist Jonathan Steya said the same thing, adding, people are much more than the mental disorders they might experience. Ultimately, it all boils down to an important question. Do we hold Kanye accountable for his actions or continue making excuses for him? The thing is, whether or not medication worked for Kanye, it's his responsibility to seek help. It may be hard, but it's what he needs to do. He knows that his disorder impacted his marriage to Kim, and he knows it's deeply affected those around him, but he isn't addressing it. He has been open about what being bipolar looks like for him, and that's a fantastic first step. It's great for sparking conversation, but now Kanye needs to actually do something about it. Maybe some people think this whole thing is for attention, but he's certainly put his money where his mouth is too. A few anti-Semitic remarks were worth over a billion dollars to him, and there's no excusing that. We don't know Kanye's motives, but in the end, the damage is still the same. The harm he's caused does not go away just because he has a mental illness. And as for how we address this in the first place, that's another point worth making. Some news coverage has treated Kanye as a joke or dismissed his diagnosis. Then when his mental illness is addressed, it's sometimes done in a stigmatizing manner. Calhoun, a psychiatry resident from Yale, believes that Kanye's comments and mental illness should be spoken about separately because one does not cause the other. We don't need to stigmatize people with bipolar disorder as racist or anti-Semitic. That's just kind of a Kanye thing. Personally, I feel that if Kanye were a famous woman instead of a man, I don't know, say Amanda Bynes or Britney Spears, he would have already been made to get help or even been placed in a conservatorship. Instead, Kanye was, and is to some extent, just treated like some misunderstood genius. At the end of the day, two things can be true at the same time. Kanye needs help and he needs to be held accountable too. But at the end of the day, these are just my opinions, my thoughts on things, and I'm gonna leave it at that. So thank you so much for making it through the end of today's episode. I hope you learned something new today. And if you did, make sure you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest episodes. I really appreciate you sticking it out all the way to the end of the episode, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye.